on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. It's not normal to have the word wild be associated with medical care, but we really didn't want to be normal. The fact that we don't look at those basic things, is the habitat right, is the food right, is the exercise right, is endlessly frustrating to me. You would never put a chimpanzee in an office, sit them in a chair all day in front of screens, and then be like, we just can't figure it out. Uh, we think it needs more drugs. The medical system, I think it's kind of stuck in this no man's land. There's so much more we can do. We wanted to take those ancient truths and really teach those to people. And we wanted to do cutting edge stuff. We call it genomics-based precision medicine. Our our culture is constantly selling the story that your happiness is going to come from outside. You're actually in control of it. Optimize your current life and then talk about the lifespan. Mental, emotional, and spiritual health are health, not just how many years that you've lived. Episode number 76 of the Wild Fed Podcast, where wild foods meet precision medicine with Dr. Matt Dawson, is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Right now at SirThrival.com, Pine Pollen and Pine Pollen Pure Potency are on sale. Pine Pollen Pure Potency is one of Sir Thrival's flagship products, and I designed it over a decade ago for men in andropause, for people who need a testosterone boost, and for my future self, since I knew one day I'd need it too. That's because as men age, their natural testosterone production begins to decline. I wanted a natural alternative to pharmaceutical testosterone, and I chose pine pollen because it's a rich plant source of testosterone and other male hormones. But I also added the root of stinging nettle, too, because sometimes the issue isn't a lack of tea, but rather a naturally occurring substance called sex hormone binding globulin, and that can bind up your own tea. But stinging nettle root helps to liberate that testosterone so your body can use it. Today, now that I'm in my 40s, pine pollen pure potency is my go-to testosterone support. With a touch of orange peel, vanilla bean, and maple syrup, it's also delicious. If you or someone you know wants a gentle, all-natural testosterone boost, check out pine pollen pure potency from Sir Thrival. And right now, it's on sale at SirThrival.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by LearnNatureSlanguage.com. Harvesting your own food is an awesome experience, but it can be really overwhelming when you're first learning. One essential but often overlooked skill is the ability to read the tracks, signs, and sounds out on the landscape. Wilderness guide and mentor Chris Gilmore, who you may remember from episode 58 of this show, is a tracker, hunter, and wild forager who's taught thousands of people to read the landscape. Whether you're a hunter looking to improve your tracking skills, a forager looking to read the landscape in search of wild food and medicine, or an outdoor enthusiast who wants to see more wildlife, Nature's Language is an online course designed to heighten your awareness and increase your knowledge and skill set. This Complete at Your Own Pace course includes lifetime access to a 12-week training, six live mentoring sessions, six workbooks and field journals, over 20 pre-recorded video lessons, and audio nature awareness meditations, plus access to an online community. Wild Fed listeners get 25% off the course with the coupon code WILDFED25. Check out the trailer at LearnNatureSlanguage.com where the coupon code WILDFED25 gets you 25% off. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. Today's episode with Dr. Matt Dawson's a reminder for me of just how I got here. I arrived at Wild Foods and the lifestyle of hunting, fishing, and foraging through the avenue of nutrition and healthy lifestyle. After over a decade of learning and teaching about healthier living, I eventually decided that since most of the ancestral approaches I was taking were aimed at recreating many of the conditions of our biologically natural lifestyle— that of hunting and gathering, maybe I'd just start doing it rather than recreating it. So I set off into nature to start sourcing my own food. Dr. Matt Dawson's a physician who arrived at similar conclusions, and he guides his patients towards ancestral living and eating patterns to help them optimize their health and productivity. But he also practices precision genomic medicine, two things you might not imagine fitting together until after you hear this interview. 
Dr. Dawson's practice is called Wild Health, and this interview is a very intriguing dive into the philosophy that informs the type of medicine he practices. But he's also hosting an event this May, that's May of 2021, in Kentucky called the Wild Health Summit. And I'm honored to be one of the speakers there, along with some of the foremost names in wild foods and ancestral living. In fact, one of my foraging heroes, Sam Thayer, whose books are my go-to recommend for any new forager, will be there too. So if you like this interview, consider joining us in Kentucky, May 28th through the 30th. Also, be sure to tune in next week where we'll be doing something really different for this show. Dr. Matt is going to turn things around and he'll be interviewing me. So if you want to get a behind the scenes look into the philosophy behind this show, be sure to tune in for that. I spend so much time here interviewing other folks that I rarely have the chance to share my own content. So it'll be exciting to put that out next week. Spoiler, we already recorded it and it's a banger. So enjoy this conversation. Tune in next week and I hope I'll see you in Kentucky next month. Dr. Matt Dawson, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, man, I'm really uh, looking forward to this conversation. You know, I, uh, of course, got my start uh, in media talking about health, and that led me eventually to WildFed. And uh, I really want to hear about your practice, um, which is called Wild Health, right? So tell us about that. Tell us about you. Tell us about what you do. Sure. Well, I, I, uh, I am really excited to be on and talk to you. I think I had mentioned to you before that I am a physician. Um, I do listen to a lot of podcasts, but they're mainly for education. And your podcast is the one that I listen to for fun. So it's a lot of fun to be able to talk to. It <laughs> means a lot to podcast. me, man. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Tell us yeah, so, about your, uh, your practice. Yeah, it's called Wild Health. Um, so we started it several years ago and it, it's not normal, uh, I guess, to have the word wild be associated with medical care, um, but we really didn't want to be normal. We don't, we don't think the traditional care model really works. There's a lot of problems with it. And so the, the word wild really means a couple things. Um, it partly has to do with what the word wild in your show has to do with. It's the wilderness. It's uh, getting into the wild and nature. We think that a lot of what people need to really be healthy and to heal is being in nature. We're just so disconnected from nature. But, but it also is an allusion to kind of cutting edge science. We, it's kind of interesting when, when I think about the medical system, I think it's kind of stuck in this no man's land. Um, on the one hand, we're way too advanced sometimes. I think we've forgotten so much ancient wisdom. I mean, you think about Hippocrates, he had health rules, he called them uh, 2,400 years ago in the fourth century BC. And he said things like, walking is man's best, best medicine, let food be thy medicine, and medicine thy food. Um, he said, it's far more important to know that what person the disease has than what disease the person has. And <laughs> yeah. Things like that, which like they make sense, but we've kind of forgotten them. And we, we became very science oriented, which is good, um, but we forgot that stuff. And at the same time, the frustrating thing to me is that medicine is always kind of 30 years behind, which is not a big deal when science is moving 30, 30 slow. years behind what the research shows you're saying in practice, it's 30 years behind of, of what we have learned. Yeah. And, and those of us kind of, uh, I, before this, I did a fair amount of research and published and, and have written and, um, in those circles, we kind of always talk about medicine, kind of community medicine, like you go to see your family medicine doctor. It always is about 30 years before science and literature actually becomes accepted and is into practice. And university systems are 10 years behind, which is great. But even that is just when science is moving as fast as it is now, there's so much more we can do. So right. it's this weird middle ground that we just – didn't want to be in. We wanted to take those ancient truths and really teach those to people. And we wanted to do cutting edge stuff. Like what we do in our practices, we call it genomics based precision medicine. So every patient we see, we sequence their DNA. We look at their microbiome. We do a lot of blood tests. We talk to them, which is important. That's kind of a lost art in medicine. <laughs> and we combine all that. And, and the science shows us that you actually can do that and make a, a bigger impact. So that's what the, the wild means. It kind of has two meanings there. I'd like to comment on a couple of things you said. Um, one, I've endlessly been frustrated by the way modern, med you know, there's like a lack of human zoology going on in medicine, 
right? So if, if I was working as a caretaker in a zoo, before I started looking at high tech treatments for an animal that wasn't doing well, was failing to thrive, you know, I would be asking myself, is the habitat right? Is the food right? Is the exercise right? You know, the basic stuff, is this animal getting correct exposure to the elements, all the things that, you know, would be native to it should, had it been in the wild and not in a zoo and where humans are living clearly in a kind of zoo now, and we're not really in the wild anymore. The fact that we don't look at those just basic things is endlessly frustrating to me. Um, you know, cause it seems to me like, for instance, in this, you know, this COVID era where it's like, you're not getting any top down messaging from the government about vitamin D, about exercise, about basic health stuff. You only get this sort of, um, this, you know, vaccine story, or you get this distancing story, you get this mask story, but n where is like the basic health education? Why is it so lacking? The other thing I want to comment on, uh, Hippocrates, you know, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food is kind of how I ended up doing wild fed. I thought about that statement for so many years and it led me to eventually go like, oh, how do you do that when the food is no longer medicine? Where do you find the food that has medicine? And that's how I end up here today with you doing this show. So, uh, but I'm curious about that. Like, where is the basic health education gone? Why do we not get like just the fundamentals before we start adding in, you know, all this precision stuff? Yeah, I, I love that. Uh, I wrote down that lack of zoology you said, and, and just in full transparency, I'm totally going to steal that and use that because it's, <laughs> it's, it's great. I mean, it's 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 exactly what we do and what we try to do. Like when, when we see a patient, we never start diving into what does your lab test show. It's what do you eat, when do you eat, who do you eat with, what do you do for exercise, um, when do you sleep, how do you sleep, how much time are you in nature, what's your mindfulness practice. That stuff, that environment and what you're putting in yourself and what you're immersing yourself in is so much more important than the little details or the things that we can measure. So um, why we're not doing it? I mean, we could get into all kinds of uh, conspiracy theories about who's actually controlling medicine and the medical schools and things like that. But um, instead of kind of answering why aren't we, we just said, hey, let's do it. Like yeah. that, that's the way it should be done. And that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, man. Um, tell me about this component about, you know, I think everybody listening gets, you know, some of the core stuff, fresh air, sunlight, exercise, quality food. But on top of that, I'd love to hear some of how you integrate nature and nature exposure, that piece of it into medicine. It's so obvious to me as somebody who's living that because I can see the difference in my life from when I had it to when I didn't. But uh, I'm really curious to hear a little bit about that as well and how that impacts patient outcomes. Sure. And I, I think we're kind of preaching to the choir. I think your listeners intuitively get this, um, but not everyone does. Uh, people who aren't listening to your podcast and our podcast, they may not understand it. And, and for me as a physician, I think an important thing is um, – when I talk to patients, they, they do tend to listen to me. And, and I also try to be science-based and tell them the scientific reasons too. It's when I say to someone, go and go take a walk in the woods, that sounds good. But then when I also tell them, Hey, look, there's this study of, uh, for example, there was a study of gallbladder surgery patients and it was a really cool study. They gave half the patients a view of trees and the other half, like a regular just view of a wall in a hospital, like you normally get <laughs> post-surgery. Yeah. Right. And the people who saw trees had less pain, fewer side effects. They were discharged from the hospital sooner. Um, there was another study in the- um, Really? And that's just a simple yeah. cholecystectomy, which is a pretty simple, pa that's a pretty simple surgery, right? It is. And I mean, the, the, the definition of a simple surgery is surgery on someone else, not yourself. But, um, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm just um, saying like interesting that even in something that simple that you have such- you know, I would imagine people recover fairly quickly, uh, obviously long-term that has impacts, but, but I'm just saying like, it's a pretty awesome to hear that just that, you know, a view out the window is enough to move the needle. Yeah. And then if you actually get outside, there's studies showing less depression, stress, anxiety, are you more calm and balanced? Um, my wife is a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and there's a really great study uh, that she likes. Uh, this researcher named Andrea Taylor found kids who have ADHD increase their attention span just with more time in nature. Um, and How much time were we talking? 
uh, it wasn't a lot of time. So in any time you're going to design a study like this, you can't really, um, you got to make it feasible to actually do. So I can't remember the exact amount, but I feel like it was less than an hour a day. It was yeah. not a lot of time, which I mean, for me, I grew up just going out into the woods and playing. So that seems like nothing, but I think sometimes we forget, like, especially now in the time of COVID, how little time kids get outside. Yeah. Um, and, and how important it is. And there's studies on, you mentioned earlier COVID. And since we brought up, there are studies showing enhanced immune system function from being outside. Um, you have reductions in your stress hormone, lower blood pressure. There's so much scientific studies. So it's intuitive, but there's also real science behind it. And I think for us, it's important to stress that to the patients. We're not just saying this as kind of a feel good thing, but it, it's important. I mean, when you think about if you had high blood pressure and your physician said, take your blood pressure medicine, um, you should also then get out into nature. I mean, studies show that also lowers your blood pressure. And so we kind of make it a compliance thing. Hey, we're telling, we're telling you to do this. We're writing you a prescription to get out into nature because it's important. Uh, so that's kind of how we, we encourage people to get down into nature and, and incorporate the wild into their life. You know, with my last podcast, Rewild Yourself, I had the opportunity to interview so many health professionals, you know, and not just in physical health, but mental and emotional health stuff too. And, and again, just to sort of reiterate how I got here, it was like, I started realizing that I was stacking a lot of different things. I'd be like, well, I have to get my forest bathing in and I have to get my squat in and I have to get my barefooting in and I got to be grounded and I got to do my orange glasses at night. And I was like doing all those things. And eventually I was like, man, if I just started hunting, fishing and foraging more, all that stuff would happen to me. And so that's kind of what led me to this lifestyle was a desire to have better health outcomes long-term, more longevity, and then ultimately really quality of life. Um, and I want to talk about that piece with you too. Um, but what, what, what is the overall, like, you know, you're, you're hosting an upcoming, um, uh, weekend conference, right. Called wild health. And, uh, and there's a lot of primitive skill stuff that you're going to be introducing people to. And I've been wondering and wanting to ask you about that piece because it's so counterintuitive and unusual for a physician, right. To be, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to say prescribing primitive skills, but, but ultimately, uh, like at what point, you know, is it makes sense to just try to stack in all these little hacks that, or, or does it make more sense to actually just go outside and do stuff for real do stuff? So, yeah, I'm curious about that, that balance between, um, you know, it's like, hey, the mouse doesn't have enough exercise. Let's put a wheel in the cage that mm -hmm. will help, but that's not as good as letting the mouse run free in the grass. Right. So, you know, to what degree does it work to prescribe hamster wheels in people's houses and to what degree is it important for them to actually get outside and do these things for real? Yeah, you, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, we can prescribe medications to treat problems and you get side effects from those. And then we end up prescribing medications to fix those side effects and it's an endless cycle. Whereas if I tell someone to go outside and get their exercise, they get the exercise benefit and then they get all the other stacked benefits right. on That's top it. of that. I mean, th this, this weekend, um, I, I just ordered, uh, we just got in, uh, I think about 70 fruit and nut trees we're going to plant. But if you think about that day oh, wow. of planting them, we, I mean, we, when we talk about sleep, I'll hear some biohackers talk about, Hey, you need to get sun in the morning. So they get, they have uh, blue lights in the morning and then blue blocking glasses at night. And then they get on their treadmill and they're working out in the gym during the day. Um, and then uh, you're stacking all of these things. Whereas just us going out, we're going to go out early in the morning to start planting and we're going to work all day. We're going to get a good workout. We're going to be exhausted by the time it's time to sleep. Um, just being outside and doing those things, you get so many of those benefits, um, that normally we would be telling people to do them one at a time. And it's just such a more, um, productive way. I mean, when we talk about writing a kind of prescribing, getting outside, it's, it's not because it's, a um, a cutting edge or interesting thing to do. It's because it works like that's, that just works for people. And we're trying to, to get people to do what works to keep them healthy. Yeah, because also planting those trees, it's like you're going to get exposure to uh, soil microbes, yep. right? In the gazillions, they're going to be under your fingernails. They're going to end up in your elementary canal. You're mm -hmm. you're going to get exposed to colors like the blue overhead and the green down below, which are so soothing psychologically. 
you're going to get that fresh air, you get that vitamin D, you get exposure to ultra complex environments compared to the indoor environment. I mean, we could just go on and on probably for the next hour, just naming the benefits of planting those trees versus what you get in the gym, which is not to disparage the gym. But, you know, I, I think a lot about, um, where humans appear to be headed. And, uh, I'm, I guess it's kind of early in the interview to ask you this, but when you look out at this thing, um, this idea of human beings leaving earth and colonizing places. Like I, I ask myself a lot, like, is that even really conceivable? Because I just started a book uh, by Shauna Swan called Countdown. I don't know if you've seen this. It's a, it's called Countdown, uh, how our modern world is threatening sperm counts, altering male and female reproductive development and imperiling the future of the human race. And it's all about sort of how our fertility is tanking to a level. She sort of equates it to, climate change. She's like, what we know about fertility right now and the falling fertility is like where we were with climate change 40 years ago. Understanding it was happening, but not really taking it seriously yet. Um, and I just think about the future of the world, you know, and the idea that human beings could leave earth and its microbes and its sun and its fresh air and its pressure and its gravity and all those things. And we could just go live on another planet or go like live in a space station long-term and be reproductively viable and be healthy just doesn't seem possible to me. Um, you know what, you know what I'm saying there? Like, do you, do you think this is like a realistic thing or do you think that for actual health, human beings need to have this nature immersion? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's history repeating itself. When we think that we can, um, are that smart that we can kind of create the environment that we could thrive and live in another planet like that. It just reminds me of, of medicine. How many times in medicine we've thought that, uh, we're smart enough to create a medication or some drug to fix a problem. And then we'd realize that everything else is, is, uh, connected and we end up causing more problems, uh, yeah. than solutions. And we can solve these one minor problem at a time, but, but to, to recreate the ecosystem and, <laughs> and, and everything we have on earth, does not seem possible. And, and I, I do know the book you're talking about, and it's fascinating because it, what I think what it reminds me of too, is that we all worry as we should about earth and what we're doing to earth and destroying the earth. Um, but to think that we're going to leave and go somewhere else, I think is, is foolhardy. I think in the end, um, nature kind of wins. Um, I, I think, I mean, you see the, the sperm counts going down, maybe population decline, but maybe other things. I think we're, when we talk about hurting earth, we're, we're hurting ourselves. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, I think we can, we can work with, with nature in the world to, to save earth, but really kind of, kind of saving ourselves. Cause if we don't, yeah, I mean, nature's going to win. The earth is going to be here. Um, so I think we need to focus a little more on this planet. I, I know that uh, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, uh, they're, totally into that. But honestly, I wish they were pouring their billions into improving this earth instead of looking for another one. Yeah, man. I always say it's like a person in a bad relationship who's just going to try to jump into another <laughs> relationship, you know, and not go like, Hey, what, how am I contributing? Like, what do I need to do to be a better person to have a healthier relationship? And the idea we're going to like just trash a planet and then we're going to figure it out on the next one. It's just like, come on, it's a forehead slapper. Like really? Uh, man, what's yeah. your story? How'd you end up at this stuff? I mean, as a physician, were you always thinking like this or did you have like an aha moment where things started to shift for you? Yeah. I mean, um, I like to tell people I'm, I'm a physician, but I want to be a farmer when I grow up. Um, I, I've always kind of <laughs> felt a connection to the land and, um, I do, I grow a lot of food and raise a lot of animals as well. And, um, so I, I think I looked at those two things as separate for a long time, the kind of my work in medicine as a physician and then the connection to the land and, and, learning how to raise and grow food and, and eat wild foods and things like that. Um, and then I realized they could come together and not only could they, but it would be beneficial for others as well. And so a real kind of aha moment came too. I think when uh, around four or five years ago, my co-founder of wild health, we, we were teaching other physicians, but it was a different skill set, And he had some really difficult problems with his lipids, with his cholesterol. It was just, they were just sky high. And he went the traditional medicine route and he got worse. His doctor started him on a statin. He got really bad muscle breakdown and myopathy. And at the time he was going through that, we noticed the science on genomics and precision medicine and how it really was there. Like when we dug into his DNA, we saw that 
that medication his doctor put him on almost guaranteed him to have this muscle breakdown and myopathy. And we realized that no one was actually practicing according to the cutting edge science. So we dove all in to go there, to go for the genomics and figure out how to bring that to the masses. But at the same time, what he and I like to do in our spare time was um, be in nature and go on trail runs or go mountain biking or just spend time in nature and learn about that. And I think when we started down the path of the genomics, that's when we realized, you know what, if we're starting from scratch, if we're trying to redesign and do this better, let's do what we actually believe in and incorporate the ancestral wisdom as well and pull nature into it. And so that was kind of our, our aha moment. We realized like we can't work in this system anyway. Let's just do it how we think is actually best and just kind of throw everything away and, and start over. Yeah, your genome too. It's not like... Um your genome and the environment are unrelated things, right? It's like sh been shaped by the environment, you know, with the only other really significant influence being sexual selection, which is, I guess, ultimately environmental as well. But, but really, I mean, it's the environment working with the epigenome and the genome that bring brought us to this place where we're at now anyway. Right. So the idea that the two are separate seems a little bit foolhardy. Um, so that, that part seems like, yeah, just kind of obvious, but um, I'd love to hear, you know, obviously you can't share specifics too much about patients, but this approach that you're taking, you know, are, what kind of results do you see for people who have otherwise sort of intractable or difficult cases? Yeah. So when we first started doing it, we didn't know if we were right or not. We just kind of had a hypothesis and um, we got really great results with friends and family and others. And um, we've seen things, um, for example, uh, LP little a, that's the most atherogenic cholesterol particle, the one that leads to, to heart attack and stroke the most, the bad one. Uh, and traditionally it's taught that you can't get that down with lifestyle, diet, things like that. And, and we do, like we showed over six months, on average, our patients decrease their LP little a by 22%, which is more wow. than a statin medication. Really? Um, yeah, things wow. like, yeah, the global measures like HRV, on average, our patients go up about 15%. And we've got a bunch of statistics like that, which um, they're kind of boring sounding, but they're important to us just to measure. But around inflammation, uh, the lipids, like I mentioned, HRV, those things, we, we do show um, really good benefit. But the, honestly, the things that are most important to us are a little harder to measure. And those are what I get most excited about. Um, when, when I say that I'm thinking about actually a, a patient I saw today, um, it was, uh, he's kind of a high powered C-suite founder of a company. And the last couple of years I've been working with him on performance, brain optimization, longevity. And then we had a really kind of a breakthrough today. He had been, um, struggling with, motivation, purpose, and some stuff like that. And while he came originally just thinking about the, this optimization and all of these things, today we finally, I got his mind wrapped around actually getting out of the city. Um, he's in uh, one of the biggest cities in the world and spending several days in nature. And we've done that quite a few times with patients. And it's really interesting, Daniel, too, that when we get people's mind wrapped around that and they do it like the improvement in their biomarkers too. Like when you get someone mm -hmm. to take some time and spend some time in nature and do that, uh, I don't have like objective data on that because it's not like we can randomize a bunch of people to go in nature for three days from our, from our uh, client list and others to stay in the city. But anecdotally, the results from that, not just in their biomarkers, but then just talking to them and how they feel, which is the most important thing. Who cares about your LP little a and your CRP and that stuff if you're depressed and not motivated and don't have a purpose? So we do measure those things. We get good results. Um, but then really getting people to ask the important questions and to find purpose. I think that's a big, a big, uh, a big reason why nature is so important too, just to give people that space. You know, one of the things that's come up over the years when I explore how people living pre-industrially and in particular pre-agriculturally, like how their health was compared to modern people or post-agricultural peoples, it's like almost every indus you find that people were better off before, particularly when you start looking at mental health issues and emotional health issues and, th and things like that. But the one area where people often go immediately. And I think to a degree it's true is they'll say, Hey, lifespan's longer. 
And it's like, well, there's a couple factors. Obviously, we had a tremendous about what 50% child mortality in the past. And when you sort of factor that out, uh, you're like, okay, you know, maybe people, it's not like everybody was dying in their 30s. It's like an average. And then also archaeologically, right, it's hard to date skeletons past 55. So they'll just call that the max age. And it gives the impression that people live much longer today. But let's say, you know, I think people do probably on average live longer today. So if we accept that, it reminds me of sort of that zoo analogy again, because you look at the zoo and you go, hey, guess what? A lion lives longer in a zoo than it does in the wild. But would it prefer to be in the wild? <laughs> You know, and uh, and that part's really interesting to me. What you just said about the mental health piece or the happiness piece and how it you know affects your health, because yes, you might be able to have your lifespan stretched out um, by medicine, but if you're not happy, then that's kind of terrible. The idea of like a longer but less happy life <laughs> versus a slightly shorter but happier life, and then of course the goal being that you can have both. So I guess that's my next question to you: is like, can you have both? Can you have the um, benefits uh, of living this modern lifestyle in the sense of that precision medicine and that long lifespan, uh, but still some of the robust health that is our sort of birthright as a, a, another wild species on the planet? We'll get right back to the show in a moment, but first. I'm excited to welcome our newest show sponsor, Raw Optics. That's raoptics.com. Before humans had artificial lighting, there was just the sun, moon, stars, and of course, the light of our fires. Contrast that with today when unnaturally bright artificial indoor and outdoor lighting turn our nights into day and we actually stare on purpose into brightly lit screens. Did you know that artificial light can cause negative health outcomes? That's because unnatural lights, particularly those from our screens, are high in blue light. Blue light from the sun sets our circadian rhythm, but today's artificial lights are blue light dominant, and that artificial light is throwing our bodies into chaos. Eye strain's an obvious symptom of screen time, but so are headaches, fatigue, hormone disruption, metabolic damage, weight gain, and probably worst of all, sleep disruption with its whole host of other health issues. Raw Optics produces the finest blue light blocking glasses. These scientifically engineered lenses filter out unnatural blue light and protect you from the harmful effects of screen time and artificial lighting. They're the only blue blocking glasses on the market that use melanin to tint the lenses, the same pigment found in your eyes and skin, which gives unparalleled color perception. These lenses are combined with stylish, exquisitely produced frames for a perfect solution to modern blue light problems. I have both a day and night pair, and I'm very impressed with the quality, clarity, and style. Wildfed listeners get 15% off by going to raoptics.com forward slash wildfed. Again, it's raoptics.com slash wildfed for 15% off your order. Now, back to the show. Talking about average lifespan is just not that helpful because of the infant mortality and things like that, that we've kind of corrected and, and so many things like bacterial infections and stuff that we can treat now. Um, but um, it's in, people are, seem to be obsessed right now with kind of longevity and lifespan. Um, but it's, and so we talk about it a lot with our patients. But I, I tell my patients frequently, my, my goal isn't to get you to live a long time. It's to get you to know why do you want to live a long time, to have yeah. a purpose, and then do it. There's a really great quote from Sophia Loren which I like, which is, I think she said, I may get it wrong slightly, but she said, there's a fountain of youth. It's in your mind, your talent, the creativity you bring to your life and the lives of people you love. And when you learn to tap this source, then you will truly have defeated age. And I I like to remind our patients of that because I do want to help them maximize their lifespan and longevity, but it's kind of a waste if, if they don't really know why, if they don't have a purpose and if they're not happy. So we want to optimize kind of your current life for those things and then talk about the lifespan. Uh, that's that's kind of our goal for our patients, that holistic approach um, to their health and, and to not forget that um, mental, emotional, and spiritual health are health, not just how many years mm-hmm. that you've lived. You know, as I uh, do the work that I'm doing, I'm acutely aware of how ancient things like hunting, fishing, and foraging are, and therefore how any contribution I make to it is going to be very minor because this has been going on for millions of years. And I'm, a, you know, my life is just a drop in the bucket and my contribution is small, but what I want to contribute to it 
is I note today that if I look at people who spend time in the outdoors recreationally, so if I was looking at people who hike, backpack, camp, climb, kayak, canoe, ski, snowshoe, any of that stuff, uh, you tend to see a person who's got, you know, a, a sort of better than average health practices. But then when I look at the people who hunt and fish very often, man, it's like, oh, they're there's like a disconnect there. They're getting that time in nature and they care about it, but you'll see often like really unhealthy people and it, particularly when it comes to obesity in the hunting community and in the fishing community too. And so it's like my hope to fuse health thinking, ancestral health thinking with the world of, again, to whatever limited degree I'm capable of doing with my own life energy, but it's like trying to fuse those things together. So I don't know what the question is there really, but I want to just kind of put it to you. Like, what do you, do you notice what I'm talking about in that if you look at outdoor recreators, they tend to live healthy lifestyles and that's what led them to outdoor recreation. But when you look at people who are still doing the ancestral practices, you don't see so much health. And uh, yeah, so, you know, they might be harvesting wild game, but then either they're really not eating it usually, or they're eating it only very occasionally. Um, and they're eating a lot of fried food and they're drinking a lot of beer and they're doing all those kind of things that, that break them down. And so when I try to express to people like, Hey, I got into hunting from a health perspective, I think a lot of people are like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting observation and I haven't really thought deeply about it, but as I'm listening to you talk about it, I, I, I think the first, um, thought that comes to my mind is, uh, like a lot of things, it's it's your approach to them. Did, did someone come to this outdoor kind of lifestyle and nature from a, a mindful point of view? Like I'm I'm going to do this because it's important, or did they kind of fall into it because um, they were raised that way and they always were raised that way? Because if they if it's not from a mindful point, it's just what they've always done. I think it's very easy to also just not mindfully eat what everybody else eats, eat the McDonald's, mm -hmm. eat the fast food and live the rest of a, a kind of a non mindful lifestyle. So I don't know if that's the reason or not, because I just haven't thought about this much, but that's, I mean, in my mind, mindfulness and intention is so important. And if um, someone's doing it because they've always done it, I, I wouldn't necessarily expect them to get all the benefits from it. <laughs> right, um, right, right. Yeah. Especially when your tree stand is like a, a lazy boy chair, or you're hunting, <laughs> truck, you know, but uh, I'm curious about that mindfulness piece, man, and what role that really plays in everything, at least in your own practice um, with your patients. Mm -hmm. Because for me, uh, I have taken up, I'd say probably I take the weekends off, but about four to five times, ideally five times a week, I sit down and meditate in the mornings and, uh, and pray too. And, um, if I don't have those, my blood pressure is significantly higher. I'm somebody who tends towards a higher blood pressure. Um, and a big part of how I deal with that is through mindfulness and it works for me. I'm somebody who gets revved up pretty high. And when I do, I get into that sympathetic nervous system state. I'll spend the whole day there if I'm not careful. News, politics, things like that get me freaking hot under the collar, man. And so I'm always having to really back away from it for my health, you know, for my mental well-being, but also for my physical health. Um, so yeah, so meditation, I'm not particularly good at it, uh, but I do it and it has changed things for me. And it's certainly made me a calmer person and more reflective and, and capable of dealing with a little bit more stress than I was capable of dealing with before. Um, but I'm curious uh, for your own patients and in your own life, like how you see that piece, because it's something that in medicine, we didn't really start hearing about until fairly recently. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's timely you asked me this question because last weekend um, I spent three days in a cabin by myself in the woods and reflected on this a lot. So I do have some oh, thoughts. Yeah. Um, and, and, and actually I was forced to do that. Uh, um, the chair of our board actually, asked me not long ago, how long, when's it, when's the last time you had three days by yourself like that? And I thought, and it was actually 15 years. So he's like, you know what, you have wow. to do that. So, so I, I did. And, and not because, and I realized that it, it was difficult because I have a lot of responsibilities, but it was necessary too. Like I, I have probably 30 pages of kind of journaling and just thoughts that I think are important for, for me. And that mindfulness was one of the things I really kind of meditated and thought about. And I think a lot of people talk about mindfulness and meditation as kind of one thing. And 
uh, meditation is great. It's really critically important. So much research behind it. It's just, it is. I, when I talk about mindfulness though, I do count meditation as that, but I, I think of it as so much more. Um, w- one of the kind of, uh, questions I asked myself over this weekend. And, and I believe that the quality of your answers you get depend on the quality of your questions. So I tried to ask good questions. And the question I asked myself one day is, what do I need and what do I want? And when I started listing the things that I want out of life, um, I realized that a lot of them depended on external factors or things outside of my locus of control. And the one that I found that did not depend on anyone or anything or any situation was peace and contentment. And I realized Mm. that the only thing that depended on was two things, um, mindfulness and gratitude. And so I kind of compressed those into a concept for myself, which I called mindful gratitude. And as I started thinking about that concept, I realized that um, a couple of the other things on my list of wants, like happiness and joy, would flow directly from that. And all of the other things that I wanted as well, kind of love and laughter and purpose and those things, those things were both amplified and the odds of them happening were increased by this mindful gratitude. And <laughs> so when I so when I talk about mindfulness, that's what I mean. I mean, actually noticing. Uh, there, there's, there's a great meditation by um, a teacher. I think his name is Bergs. Uh, and one of the lines, I'm going to mess it up as well. But um, he said, we're all kind of called to this planet. We come with a curiosity. And we're not called to be inventive uh, or, or um, to show how much we can do, but we're called to notice. And when we really notice the beauty around us and have in a mindful way and are grateful for it, that's when we're really living um, a beautiful human life. So that's what mindfulness mindfulness is to me is, is to is to notice and then actually sit with kind of the beauty around you and all the gifts that you have. Man, and you know we have so many living here in this part of the world in this moment, and there's so much going on that is like again gets me hot under the collar stuff that I find endlessly frustrating. But man, do we have it good! And I notice, mm-hmm. uh, like I was fishing with my uh, producer this weekend, and uh, I get a fish on the line. I'm bringing it up through the ice, and it's we're fishing at um, 30 fathoms, so it's 180 feet. <laughs> And as I'm bringing this fish up, it takes a little while, you know, little ice fishing rods that we have. And my tendency is to want to just rip that fish up to the top. And then I'm thinking about in that moment how this is like one of my favorite feelings. I've joked with my wife, like, hey, when I'm on my deathbed, if you could just hand me a line that has a fish on it, <laughs> like if, I don't, that's, that's my last feeling. Great, you know. Uh, so I'm bringing this fish up and I'm, I'm realizing, Hey, if I don't take a moment to be really mindful right now, this is going to be over. And then I'm going to be sitting there going like, I wish I was fishing, you know, uh, (laughs) like why not just be in that moment? Or like, uh, my brother just left to go down to Florida for a uh, motorcycle event. He's uh, into racing motorcycles and he's going to be with this pit crew and he's super excited about it. And I just said to him before he left, like, Hey man, be in these moments because this is what you're thinking about all the time when you're at work. And it's so easy to like, when we finally get to do the thing that we always think we want to be doing to not actually even be that present with it, which is so so hard to understand how we're like that. But, uh, but I've, I found that my practice when I'm sometimes I'll be foraging and it'll be like a shaft of sunlight comes through the canopy and hits me on the face. And I just have to remind myself like, dude, these are the sweetest moments. Like don't rush through these moments because these are the memories that I want, you know, my mind to be, be filled with memories of these perfect moments. Like a moment with my wife where we're laughing, we're having such a good time and you feel all that love and all of that sort of ecstatic bliss together. And it's like, don't rush through this. Like, don't try to get to the next thing. But because of the way, like our pace of life, where we're always like running from thing to thing, it's really easy to do that and to not be present with the things that we actually love when we finally get to do them, if that makes sense. It, it totally does. And um, I guess two things I'd come at. Number one, um, thanks for converting the fathoms because I wrote that down. Like I got to look up what that, what a fathom is. Six so feet. Nice, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah 30 Weird nautical away. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So appreciate that. It saves me some time. And then I, I think, uh, when you mention the sunlight, that's that's the interesting thing to me because 
the other examples you gave are beautiful. Like, like, like it makes sense that you would appreciate those. Um, and I think for a lot of people, like, especially with COVID and things that are going on, you can get so down in the world and maybe you're like in the city and you don't have, you can't go fishing. Maybe you, maybe you don't have a wife that you're going to laugh with, like you mentioned, <laughs> but, but just yeah. but like just going outside and uh, over the weekend, one of the things I did one day, I went outside and, and I picked up a, a leaf and I looked at it for so long. It was so like marvelous, like just the veins in it so much that I could notice. And no matter where you are, you can go out and you can find a flower coming through the concrete or just something small. And to me, that the ability to notice that, like you said, the sunlight, like that's enough. And to take the small things so that you don't have to wait for the fishing trip um, with your best friend or the special moment, but to create those moments with the little things and really to notice that beauty. That's the, that's the real magic trick in my mind is to not have to wait for those moments, but to create them on your own with what's around you. Yeah. I've been talking about this a lot, but I, I just finished the book endurance uh, about mm. uh, Shackleton's journey down to the Antarctic. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that story, but they, you know, they're, they're trapped almost two years on the, on the ice and uh, through, they make it through an entire winter, you know, in Antarctica in the early 1900s uh, with almost nothing. They're like 20, I think they're 27 guys. And um, it's just hell. I mean, everything they're going through is hell. And yet they, their journals are so high spirited and they're taking pleasure in these little things. And, uh, you know, one of the things I love about the story is the name of the boat that uh, they eventually lost to the ice is called the endurance and so that's you know this famous book written in the 1940s about their their adventure there <laughs> but uh you know and they just do things that are you know people today just almost you feel like aren't capable of anymore <laughs> what they went through but but anyway uh they were so high spirited and they found joy in the littlest things i mean you know six months of darkness in canvas tents right surviving out there and yet they're they they're discussing like these little pleasures with so much zeal. And I'm like, so when I catch myself, you know, complaining about the Wi-Fi on the airplane or whatever kind of ridiculous <laughs> little problem I'm having, it's like, dude, have some endurance, like find the positives here because uh, it is easy to get, you know, in our culture, it's, it's like, you look at our culture, you brought it before. It's like easy to get kind of into the conspiracies about health or anything, because at this point, almost anything you look at, it seems like it's the designed to do the opposite of what you'd want to mm -hmm. it to be you know like the healthcare system seems like a disease care system you know like that kind of a thing and you look at our culture and how much bitching and complaining and then how much distraction like what you're talking about now how mindfulness and gratitude um they're like magic tricks and not magic tricks like magic spells like some kind of tr something truly otherworldly that you can just shift to gratitude and suddenly your entire outlook can change in a way that money can't change it and fame can't change it and travel can't. It's like just gratitude will change everything for you. Yet our culture doesn't seem to really put any effort there. You know, maybe once or twice a year on holidays, it seems like it's always distraction and complaining and bitching. I just, I just had the pleasure of watching Meghan Markle, you know, talk about how hard it was to be a princess. Oh my gosh. You know, in the royal family, it's so hard. Uh, you know, all that kind of stuff where it's like our culture is constantly selling the story that your happiness is going to come from outside. And so I really appreciate what you said before, because once you realize that your happiness is actually something you're, you're actually in control of it. That's why I bring up the endurance story. These guys were in charge of their own happiness in the worst scenario imaginable, trapped in the Antarctic over the winter time with no hope of rescue. And they're happy because that's like something we're in control of. And it's, and it's, so disempowering to think you're going to get it from external sources. Yeah. And, and you're exactly right. We've designed our environment to make it almost impossible to be mindful and to notice. I mean, over the weekend when I was doing this, I had all of my electronics off and I noticed things and I was, was, was grateful for them. Whereas now I'm back in civilization. And I mean, during this during this podcast, embarrassingly, my phone went off with a text and like I'm, I'm uh, talking to someone who I, I love listening to, to your great podcast. And yet I've got notifications going off and there's things all around. So I'm just not 
it's not possible to notice these things when we have these constant distractions and notifications. And it's just, and we've done this to ourselves. I mean, we're the ones that we get the flipboard notification constantly and we get the text and we get all these things. We're bombarding ourselves and making it impossible to get to this ability to notice and to be mindful and then to have that peace and contentment that we want. And then we complain about it, um, that we don't have it. And, and like you kind of brought up before, the people who are really pushing these things, though, at the same time, the Elon Musks and the Zuckerbergs and whatnot, they're the ones who want to also us to go to Mars. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. they're the ones creating the push notifications and all these kind of things. It's just, it's what a world, man. We've given so much away. Uh, I just get really excited for like a reawakening of real humanity to happen. I mean, it's it's either inevitable or we're gone. So, you know, I hope that it's inevitable. Um, I want to ask you, I got two questions for you. I'll ask you the, I'll, I'll share them both, but we'll start with the one. Um, I want to ask you about a general prescription, you know, sort of what are your general health, um, uh, recommendations for everybody. And then after that, I'd like to talk a little bit about what genomic medicine can do because I'm not super familiar and I'm a little disillusioned with some of what I hear about because I, I sometimes think that it can be really disempowering with the idea that, oh, it's just all your genes. Because then that what t- people tend to do is just feel defeated. And I know that's not what you guys are doing, so I don't mean to imply that. Uh, I want to hear what the actual reality is because I notice uh, we do this with a lot of things. We do it with, you know, for instance, recently I, I, I was watching a news program where they were they were talking about a winter storm we were having here and they were trying to make it about climate change. And it was like, dude, that's just winter here. This is New England. Like, that's just a normal storm. Don't try to make this everything's climate change, you know? And I notice now we do that with health where it's like everything's genomic. And it's like, dude, a lot of this is your food and your lifestyle and your exercise. And, you know, you have power to some degree over your epigenome and how your genes are expressed and all of that. And we act defeated, like as if it's all just written into, you know, carved in stone forever or something like that. So um, what, yeah, what's sort of your recommendations for everybody? And then let's talk a little bit about what's possible when you go deeper into some of this precision medicine. What's it capable of? That is a great question. So um, people have probably heard the term, your DNA is your destiny, and it is not. Like that is one of the things I, I stress to people so much. Your DNA is not your destiny. Um, your DNA and the, your genomics, have um, they do have an impact. But in general, when you look at the science on this, it's probably maybe 20% of the outcome of your health. It's a small part. Wow. It's enough It's enough to talk about and to dig into. But, but what I try to tell people too is that when we look at your genomics and we look at all these tests, our, our, our goal is to give you tools, not rules. Like your, your DNA just gives us some clues as to how we can, we can enhance um, your health. And to, so to make that specific, I'll give you some examples just for myself. You mentioned what is what we kind of prescribe for everyone. Well, I think probably the number one biggest level we have when you look at all the studies is sleep, optimizing people's sleep. So it's easy to say sleep is critically important. You need to get better sleep. But it's even more helpful if we can actually look at someone's DNA and give them some tips on how they could sleep better. So, for example, myself, um, I uh, have an aura ring. I was tracking my sleep. I'm a, a bit of a nerd on some of that data stuff. And I was measuring my sleep, and but when I and I was not getting the deep sleep that I that I needed, and I was able to find that out. And I could, I tried a lot of different things. There's so many different things, so many tips people, people give you. But then I noticed, um, a couple of things with my genetics specifically, I have an FAAH SNP, a fatty acid amide hydrolase SNP, and that made me more likely to benefit from CBD. So when I took oh, CBD, okay. I had a, yeah, I had a really big boost in my deep sleep and it was a very clear and objective difference. So again, that was just a, a tool and a little tweak. And earlier you mentioned, Vitamin D. It's a great example. So we know immune function of vitamin D, how important it is. And so if we see someone has like a VDR SNP and they're potentially going to be lower in vitamin D and we look at their blood biomarkers and they are low in vitamin D, well, that's just another reason to tell them to get outside and to get some sunlight. And Just curious, I I, I don't want to derail this conversation because I love this track you're on, but I've never heard of what you just said. And I'm curious, does that mean that they have a difficult time converting uh, or creating vitamin D, synthesizing it? What, what is that that you're discussing? 
there's actually quite a few different SNPs related to vitamin D as there are with kind of anything that we look at. And it's also important, like any recommendations we give to people, we usually base them on what we call polygenic risk scores. So there are some SNPs that make you have lower vitamin D. Others mean your receptors aren't quite as efficient as other people's. Yeah, okay. um, and, and either way, it's important to not curse people. So what, what I mean by that, I see, <laughs> yeah. I see medicine. <laughs> medicine does this all the time. We tell someone they have six months to live or something like that. And we say it from a place of authority. So I don't ever tell people, Hey, you got some messed up genes here. Right. Um, I, My favorite is when somebody's it. unconscious and the doctor says, I don't think he's going to make it. It's like, dude, <laughs> yeah. no, don't say that. <laughs> yeah. Just try to help him make it. Come on. Like, just, yeah. yeah, it's funny. Oh, not put um, that in his subconscious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, so in the prescriptions for everyone are what you would think. So when we talk about sleep, diet, exercise, those are important, but we can, we can dig in a little bit like exercise. Great. Like just get out and move that. That's the first step. But then if you go a little deeper in that, we look at things like what is your um, recovery SNPs? You have certain SNPs that make you recover more, uh, more quickly or less quickly. Okay. And we can help, we can help with a training program. So just, again, I'll, I'll use personal examples. So I'm not naming patients. I was, um, I've done a couple Ironmans. I used to really enjoy endurance training. I was horrible at them, but I enjoyed them. Um, <laughs> and I, I would crush myself every day. And, um, when I looked at my genomics, I, I realized I need more recovery. And then I started thinking, Oh, wait a second. That's why every morning when I get out of bed, I have to like sit down to put my socks on. I'm so stiff and inflamed. Right, right. And, and learning that about myself, I then did less volume, more intensity, and I'm in better shape now. I'm, I'm in better physical shape. Um, so each of these things like exercise, diet, I mean, when it comes to Okay, let's just talk about exercise again. So there's something called a collagen 5A1 SNP. And if someone has, some people have certain alleles of that, they are at high risk for tendon injuries. Uh, so Achilles tendon specifically. So I may tell them, hey, if you like endurance stuff, maybe consider rowing instead of running. Um, you may want to eat more bone broth or sardines for the collagen protein. So just little tips like that. We're not, we're not, you're not going to get an injury. You're not going to get hurt because of this gene, but we can help you um, to optimize your genes. We can kind of affect some of the epigenetics and how you express those genes. So not cursing people, just, just giving them tips on, on the basic things um, w with diet too. There's so many things like there's, and I'm not going to, I give you a list of hundreds, but I'm not, mm -hmm. I, but one more, for example, is a BCMO one. If you have that SNP, you don't convert the uh, beta carotene into the active form of vitamin A as much. So for those people, I say, Hey, you got a couple options. You could just eat the active form of vitamin A. So get some organ meats, uh, things like that, or you could eat more beta carotene because you're still going to convert it, just not as efficiently. So it's, it's tips and I'm like cringing that. for vegans who have that, who are like, I'll just eat more carrots. It's like, no, you're not converting <laughs> it. Well, man, I have a, a good, my good friend, Arthur's always going on. He's like, there is no vitamin A in plants. He's like, I'm a botanist. <laughs> There's no <laughs> vitamin A in plants. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting. So it sounds like what you could do is sort of eke out a few more percentage points of performance with these, just this knowledge of your sort of hidden knowledge really of your DNA and, and how you're specific. These are all, um, are these like mutations or are they adaptations to different environments and things? I don't, I don't know if I'm saying yeah. that right, but where does this no, stuff no, rise? You, you are. It's, it's a good question. So in, in kind of a mutation versus a polymorphism, they're not the same thing. And they're kind of based on definitions of how often, how common they are and thing like, things like that. So these aren't mutations. These are adaptations. Um, like you said, like, uh, for example, one of the most common ones uh, people think about is the APOE. Uh, I'm not sure if you've heard of APOE gene, but if you have APOE4, you're at much higher risk for Alzheimer's and dementia. So mm. first off, we can do a lot about that. And we do if we find that in our patient. And it is an adaptation. So there are a lot of theories about how that, um, that polymorphism developed over time. And people with an APOE4 actually probably had an advantage ancestrally. They clotted a little better. But that improved or enhanced clotting is not a good thing today and how we live in our environments yeah. now. So they, they are kind of, uh, uh, their adaptations over time, which may have been advantageous and now they're not. And so now we have to tweak your environment a little bit to make up for, um, the, uh, 
the issue that they've caused now. I'm getting really curious about, you know, because I think for a lot of us, we've maybe we've done like an ancestry kind of thing or we've done, I did a 23andMe, you know, and, and I'm sure I fed all my genetic data to the supercomputer, you know, <laughs> whatever, but uh, it's getting traded or whatever is happening to my data now. But, but, uh, you know, looking at something like that, is that useful to people or is what you you're doing, are you doing, you know, different type of sequencing or is it the same kind of thing? Can that data be translated over? Do you start from scratch? Like how does all that work? And, and at what point culturally is this stuff going to what you're talking about going to become commonplace because it sounds like i guess you said 30 years because uh yeah. you know you go down to your family physician and they're not they're not talking about this stuff yeah um so um there's a couple really important questions there yeah so i'm going to take them one at a time one at a time the 23 and me and ancestry um so we what we did when we first started um then you know, an issue we had is we had too many patients coming to us because this makes sense. People understand when you explain it. And so we invested uh, an incredible amount. We have a really great data scientist, uh, two full stack software teams, and we built out the software to automate a lot of this and to be able to give the clinician um, all of this data and information to then be able to translate. So we built our software, for example, to be able to use the raw data from 23andMe or Ancestry. So if you were just to get your raw data, you can do that. You can go to 23andMe. There's a button where you can download your raw data. And it'll mean nothing to you. It's a massive .txt file that means nothing. Um, and even if you were to, to look at the individual SNPs, it may be more harmful than helpful because what you'll see, for example, is you may see, oh, I have a PPAR gamma SNP, and that means I can't eat um, saturated fat. That's not true. Um, it, it There are like seven or multiple PPAR alpha and gammas or seven FTOs, and you have to look at all of them, and it, it may be that you're a little more sensitive to saturated fat, for example, but it doesn't mean you can't have it. So looking at individual SNPs is not useful for an individual, but yes, we can use that data. Um, we also have our own, we use, we can use 23andMe and Ancestry, but we developed our own um, chip, our own DNA chip. So if someone comes to us and they've already got that data, we'll put it into our system, but we'll be missing a fair amount of data. Um, we would rather give someone our own saliva kit and say, hey, this has all of the data that we want. Um, so we, we so that you, the data is useful, but only if you know how to interpret it and to bring it together. How does it interact with your blood work, your microbiome, the other genes, and not individual genes? Um, your, I think the other point you made is like, when is this going to be standard practice? Um, hopefully sooner rather than later. So th the other thing that we did when we noticed there's too many people coming to us, we our background was in education and educating physicians. And we look at our job, even with patients, as education. We want to enable people, give them the tools, educate them so they don't need us anymore. We're kind of translators and guides. It's not as, we're not an all -knowing, all knowing doctor. That irritates the crap out of me. Um, but <laughs> our, as, as educators, we, we started a fellowship. So we have a 12 month fellowship. We have 87 physicians and other medical providers where we're teaching them how to do this. And then we made the software so that when they finish here, go do this. Like we think this is how medicine should be practiced. So we are trying as hard as we can to make this the standard of care um, because we think it should be practiced this way. But um, I don't know of another, I, I don't believe there is another software program other than ours that does it. Hopefully there will be. Hopefully someone, Google or someone else will do it better than us. And if they do, I'll just use theirs. <laughs> we, we yeah, just made right. it. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Are you yeah. guys, uh, are you guys taking patients and, and do you take remote patients? Cause you guys are in the free state of Kentucky, right? <laughs> we, all of my patients are, uh, remote. Um, I've got a few oh, people in Lexington cause, cause I know, but 80% of my appointments are telemedicine and that's all we do yeah. is telemedicine. We have licenses in all 50 States and, um, and yes, this, I didn't want to, um, we're not trying to do a commercial here, but yeah, wild. No, health but I'm, cu I'm curious, <laughs> man. I'm like listening to you and I, I notice on the day to day how different my wife and I are. She's blonde, blue eyed. I'm, you know, Sicilian. We're like, we're just completely different. And, and I'll, you know, for instance, she'll be like, babe, I can't eat that much bear fat. And I'll be like, what are you talking about? I feel amazing. You know, like these little differences. And what you're saying is like, oh man, I want this magic eight ball. Like I want to understand these things about myself. And, you know, I do so many practices for my health, you know, so many things, but I would love to be able to refine it this little bit, you know? So like, 
that's why I'm asking. I'm not trying to make it a commercial, but I am curious <laughs> yeah. that you are taking yeah. patients. We, we are. I mean, because of the fellowship and things, we have a lot of providers and we are always taking new patients um, now. And, and like you, the diet thing you just mentioned with your wife, um, that is why we started. So I told you this story about my co-founder and his uh, lipid and cholesterol issue. And he and I actually are on almost exact opposite diets based on our genetics um, wow. to get to good health. Like he is not vegan, um, but almost. And I like just, I could live totally on the bare fat, like you mentioned, like super ketogenic animal based. Um, and that is what has worked for us. And we, when we saw our genetics, we thought that was the case. And now as over, we've kind of experimented and gone down that route. Um, and it is the case. Um, so p- people, there's just so much g- variability from human to human. It's, it's crazy. We've had a cookie cutter system and recommendations for so long. Yeah. Cause we've, it's a factory farm. I always, I like to call it a zoo, a human zoo to be nice, but really it's like a human factory farm. I think it's kind of <laughs> obvious. And so everybody gets the same, right? Um, I got another question for you. Um, are there, first of all, that's two questions. One is, Are there any correlations to blood type? You know, there's that thing you hear colloquially colloquially, where people say like, well, you're an O positive, you're a meat eater. And, you know, that's an A minus. They're a they're a they're agrarian. Uh, So I'm wondering if that's if there's anything real there. And then the other thing is, and uh, man, it really sucks all that's happened in the world that makes this taboo to ask. But are there broad sweeping racial things that you see too, like people who are African descended versus European descended versus Asian descended versus, you know, indigenous to the Americas where you see things that like, hey, broadly speaking, uh, people from this racial descent or this racial group would be better off doing this versus this? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, and I, I mean, I can take this from a scientific point and not in a racial type thing at all. But, um, I think your first question about the blood, blood type, um, the popular thing was a blood type diet a while back. And some people still kind of ascribe to it. And I do think it, it is kind of a very, uh, crude version of what we're doing. People with the exact same blood type have slightly similar genetics. So before we could actually sequence people's DNA, um, I think it was useful, but I think okay. it's, we have a much finer tool and sharper tool now actually looking at the individual genes instead of just, and, and that would be the same as what you just said, kind of just looking at someone there are, I mean, it, it's just true. I mean, African-Americans have more sickle cell anemia. That's a kind of a common one. Everyone kind of understands, um, Ashkenazi Jews have certain specific, um, uh, things that they're more prone to. So different, different groups. I mean, we, when we first started doing this, the pro a big problem with it, um, was that it was very expensive and our first clients were like all CEOs and pro athletes, which bothered us. And that's why we, um, I grew up super poor. Uh, and, and it bothered us that we were, we were seeing that population. We had kind of a homogeneous population. Now we're doing a lot of work. Also, we, we've got the price down where like, we can do this like super cheaply because of so much automation, but we're also taking care of um, a fair number of indigenous people. It's kind of a, a, a program that we have, um, uh, kind of in the back. And it, I've been very surprised at how different the SNPs are, um, wow. for those populations. Um, and it's indigenous not, I mean, to Americans or indigenous folks from different regions of the world. Correct. So right, right now, uh, a lot of native Americans, um, we're working wow. with um, a couple of large groups here in the, in the U S. Um, I mean, they did they develop are, in isolation from all of Europe, Africa, and Asia for so long, or, you know, maybe not so long, but 14,000 years. I mean, that's a, quite a few generations, right? I think it's, if we say what a generation's 50 years, that's kind of a long time in isolation. So you would imagine certain things would develop. It is. And you start to, I mean, over time, thousands of years, you start, to, like we were talking about earlier, some of the earlier, some of the advantages, um, some people do better on a plant-based diet, depending on kind of where they, where they grew up versus you look at kind of the Inuit people who are living on kind of seal fat and, and all animal foods. And so there, there is something to, to kind of like where your ancestors are from and your, and your diet. It, it's hard nowadays to base a diet on that because we just don't know. Like, it's not like we look back a thousand years and say, where are we from? But that's kind of what the the SNPs do. I mean, we look back, how have we adapted over time? Um, and, and how does that affect how we move, sleep and eat? Um, and it's a lot of fun, like just kind of discovering that stuff now and, and being a part of it. What about, um, uh, this might be outside your wheelhouse, but 
what about like say early childhood trauma where um that has an impact on your epigenome right so therefore gene expression so is this something that's been looked at like you know how somebody's actual life has played out and how that impacts them as well yeah i would say it is one fascinating and two you're exactly right out of my wheelhouse um so there are there are um because we're not we're not looking at the epigenome but yeah there's really cool studies on uh like rodents for example and trauma and how that affects several generations later um of those rodents and and we're not as different uh, from rodents as we like right, to right. like to think um and so that is clearly a thing i mean we yeah different groups over time who have had extreme trauma, you see it playing out generation after generation. And that is fascinating area that, um, we are not able to look at at all, but, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting area to, to explore. And then tell me a little bit about what you have coming up, uh, in Kentucky this year. I'm going to be coming down there. I'm kind of excited about that. And I, I'm curious about how you, again, like how you fuse, these two worlds because I know you've got an interest mm-hmm. in the outdoors an interest in primitive skills and interest in all things wild. Um, yeah. Tell us about the event you have coming up and, and how, how all this fits together. Yeah. I kind of live in these two different worlds, like one, this science based around other physicians and, and PhDs and researchers. And then I also really love hanging out with people who have these primitive skills that I don't have. And this is my attempt to kind of bring them together. So yeah, May, May 28th through 30th, um, I think wildhealthsummit.com is, is where, but what we're going to do is on the first day, um, uh, there's a property here. It's called the Kentucky castle. It's an interesting property. It's a, it's a castle on a 110 acre working farm. I'm actually there right now. I'm sitting here and earlier today, my kids came out and we hung out with the llamas and the goats and the bull and the horses and the sheep. Um, we got animals, big organic gardens. And so for a day, full we're stone be castle, right? I've only seen the photos, <laughs> yeah. but I mean, it's a full stone castle. Super weird. Yeah. It's in the middle of Kentucky. No, uh, it's a you castle. Expect? It's fun. Yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll be there for a day and we'll talk about a lot of the kind of genomics and, and science stuff. And then the fun part is the next two days, we're going to go into the middle of nowhere. Uh, it's a 212 acre. It was a Girl Scout camp in, the, I think, the 70s and 80s. And there we're going to do learn a lot of primitive skills. So we're bringing a really incredible group in. I mentioned um, uh, kind of some some Native American and indigenous folks that work with a couple of them are going to come and teach some skills. We've got, um, you and then people like, uh, Doug Elliott, uh, Fuzz Sanderson, Sam Thayer, um, people that I, they're my heroes that I look up to. And honestly, Daniel, this is just an excuse for me to learn these skills from these people. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, I, but I figure if they're going to come together, if I can trick them all into coming together, then, um, we should invite other people as well. So we'll spend a couple days, in the wild, uh, foraging and learning how to make fire and just a bunch of fun stuff. You know, Sam Thayer, I think is, you know, probably the leading expert in foraging, or at least that's how I see him. Um, Doug Elliott, what a, I, you know, I've had the opportunity to, uh, work with him once. Uh, what a storyteller he is (laughs) really cool, really cool dude. I mean, I listened to him sing songs one night that just had me in stitches, um, anyway, I, I'm really looking forward to it. I've been thinking about sort of what I want to talk about when I'm down there, but, uh, you know, I've got this friend in Kentucky, uh, in Louisville, actually a friend and also somebody I work with, he handles customer service for my supplement company. And, um, we just have this joke where we always call, I always call it Kentopia because it just seems like everything we talk about, he'll be like, Oh, did you know you can do this in Kentucky? It's legal. And I'll be like, <laughs> You know, Maine's a pretty cool place, but it's like everything he brings up is illegal here, you know? And uh, so eventually I started calling it Kentopia because it just sounds like there's some really cool things and I've never visited. So I'm really looking forward to getting down there and, and spending yeah. some time in, in, in the free state of, of Kentucky. So it's like the wild, wild west. I'm not a big fan of rules, so it's a good place for me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That sounds like a no rules kind of an environment. Uh, but I, anyway, I really just think it's cool what you're saying about bringing these things together. Um, you know, this sort of cutting edge precision health, but then also having it founded. Because like I said, it's so obvious when you're talking about zoology, it just makes so much sense. It's like, you you obviously try to recreate all the health con- healthy conditions for the animals in the zoo. You would never put a chimpanzee in an office 
in a <laughs> sit him in a chair all day in front of screens smoking cigarettes and and you know what i mean you would never subject and then be like we just can't figure it out uh, we think it needs more drugs right yeah, yeah. you would never do that like if you can you even imagine like a hippopotamus in a pool hall geez why is its health not you know it just doesn't make any sense it's yeah. so obvious right and then well, we well, just act could... like humans are like somehow we're exempt from all of these environmental influences yeah well you could try to do it but you could never do that study because <laughs> irb wouldn't approve it like it would be unethical <laughs> and you can't you can't torture animals like that right. so it's right yeah, meanwhile it's meanwhile it's totally legal to subject your children to it yeah, it's fascinating, yeah. man. Uh, I don't know, whatever, human freedom, I guess. But um, <laughs> but for those of us who are aware, so uh, tell us again. Uh, so where what the website is, so people can go check that out. And uh, you know, I'm going to be down there. Uh, so I'd love for people listening to come join us. I think there's some you're pulling together some pretty awesome people uh, all in one place too. So you know, it's going to yeah. be a cool for anybody who's interested in in any of the kind of things we talk about on this show. I, I think it's a really great place to be. Yeah. So, um, wildhealth.com is kind of where everything is. And then, uh, we have a podcast called the wild health podcast where we just kind of blabber on about random stuff. And then wild health summit is where, uh, you could go to find the tickets, but, but all of that stuff just at wildhealth.com people can navigate and get to where they want to go. And the, you've done a bunch of shows with uh, Ben Greenfield, right? On his podcast. Um, yeah, I think I've been on uh, Ben's podcast four or five times. Yeah, um, and actually, sense. actually Ben, yeah, actually Ben is gonna. Um, I just got an email about an hour ago from him asking about the summit. I think he's gonna. I should have read the email before I said this. Um, <laughs> I don't know if he's joining virtually or in person, but um, I think he's coming. I think the email was about um, travel and stuff, so he'll probably be there too. Cool. So people can check out your podcast, check out some of your shows you did with him. He's been on this podcast before and on my other podcast a bunch too. So uh, another awesome guy. So yeah, just, I'm looking forward to it. Um, thanks for coming on today. And uh, I think you're going to be hearing from me on, you know, I'm going to be trying to get myself in there. Hopefully you take my insurance. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Cause I want to know man about my snippets, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I'll be in touch about that and uh, just looking forward to, to getting down. Thanks so much uh, for, for being on today. Any kind of closing thoughts you want to leave uh, our guests, our listeners with? No, this was, this was so much fun. I really appreciate you having me on. I forgot we were recording for a while just cause it's fun. It's fun geeking yeah. out on this stuff. So yeah, I appreciate it's good it. talking to you, man. And just like, I guess my, my last thought would be, um, I don't think these, and I know you know this, obviously, because you're the one doing it, but I don't think these two things are all actually all that different. You know, they mm -hmm. really do fit together. And uh, it's about time people started to recognize that, you know, it would be beautiful if our sciences could be founded in basic understanding of uh, our needs biologically. And so I just think it's a beautiful direction you're taking it. And uh, thanks for doing it. Yeah. And, and thank you for, I think you are um, an incredible translator of just how beautiful nature in the wild is. So I just want to, I, I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to say thank you for, for all you do for kind of rewilding people in general. It's such an important mission. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.